السلام عليكم ورحمة الله um, to... بارك الله فيكم um, this, uh, this, this uh, short lecture uh, that I'll be doing um, uh, talk or, or uh, whatever you'd like to call it um, will be, uh, won't, won't be a smooth ride so I'm going to let you know now <laughs> that uh, just keep your brains engaged a little bit inshallah um, because uh, because one of the things that we get from from uh, our tradition that advises us and these we have wonderful qawaid like principles for life so everything that's good in like the world that that's offered to us is like how to be and how to live we have all of those principles and one of those things is that if whenever we speak uh, we really have to have uh, considerations as to why we're speaking one should not speak simply because one is a speaker this type of a phenomena that one is a speaker and therefore because you're a speaker now you have to go and do a speech somewhere is actually quite problematic and the person who has the biggest problem is the one who is forced to be a speaker on top of that then there's the community who has to, who are the recipients of a speaker it's basically speaking for the sake of speaking uh, we don't have that and we don't really welcome that it's a quite a dangerous place to be it's no surprise that in the modern world that we live in in this modern dajjalic system that everyone wants to be a speaker and every single thing that you have online just entices you to say something it literally it says comment here even if you have nothing to say just put an emoji put something <laughs> but it's all designed to extract out of you certain things and um, our tradition is not one where you just want to be spewing out stuff and so that so that we have things that help us and assist us and so of those we have to ask ourselves first and foremost is it necessary when we're speaking and so in the same manner as a speaker uh, I, I personally don't like to speak because it's more worries for my this life and the next life they, they say now Ali said that the words that you use are houses that you imprison yourself in so you might want to consider which words you use in life and so it's not just the akhirah you have to be careful of what you say you also have to worry about it in this life so it stresses me out so I don't like to normally speak I like MCC and, and uh, Munir, Munir Bhai and mashallah here I didn't even know I was speaking on Friday and two, two days ago they sent me a message saying what's the topic um, so because I happened to cover this topic already when I was in Australia just a few weeks ago I thought um, less preparation time um, so that's why I picked this topic but I, I, I only chose the topic was because I think it's a very important topic in today's time I think that there's a lot of problems that are happening in, in society especially when it comes to one's understanding of wellness and well-being and not just your own but that of your family and those who are around you you'll see that a lot of this is actually by the system that we are now living in that's uh, making us think a certain way and uh, start to perceive things a certain way and believe certain things a certain way and that's why we have that hadith uh, dua that i read which was uh, oh allah show us or show me the truth i read it as the as the us um, but you would say, Allahumma arini, right? Oh Allah, show me as the truth, as the truth truly is, uh, and give me the ability to follow it, and show me falsehood as falsehood truly is, and give me the ability to avoid it. So we live in a time where tr truth and falsehood are very much conflated now. And this is something that was was absolutely the Jalik. This is one of the aims of the Jalik to start to conflate and to show things uh, in an opposite or in an opposing manner. Um, so yeah, so not only do we have to speak because it's necessary, then we are, what we want to ask ourselves is it beneficial, right? And so of course it's something that's beneficial. Um, when it comes to this uh, this topic of the jal, this is something that they they say that the, that the Sahaba would say that the Prophet Sallallahu when he spoke about it, he spoke about the jal as if it, as if the concept or the reality of the jal was something insignificant and yet still so significant to the point that we were we were wondering. Um, that is the jal in the palm trees outside and the date palms outside like that like that's how much the jal was mentioned um, which is incredible if you think about it because if there was such an emphasis at the time of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam then what, what what should be the reality that if they're thinking the sahaba are thinking that the the jal is in the date palms outside the masjid then you know 1400 years later where where, where would we think the jal would be at this point anyone in your phone <laughs> just nestled in our pockets all cozy just waiting to distract us with the ping yeah anyway so um and so so this idea of the jal so therefore you know i uh, i have then concluded to speak to myself so i'll be speaking to myself 
And then if you if you want to take notes for yourself, then, then you can. But I'm really just, you know, really genuinely just talking to myself now. Um, so, alhamdulillah. So based upon that, and based upon then the, therefore the topic, what time will we be breaking for the Salah? 8 o'clock, so 7.50, okay. And then do we resume after? Okay, 25, inshallah. Okay, so there'll be a break. Um, so if I'm able to be done by that time, then we can be done, inshallah, if, if we're able to get it done. I'll try to get it done so you guys can go and rest, inshallah. Now, so um, now when it comes to the Jal, it's the, the idea of the Jal uh, himself or the idea um, or the reality of whatever that is, um, one of the things that we see is that it's not something as explicitly mentioned in the Quran. So it's not something that's like directly mentioned, but there are many, many hadith in relation to it. And the Prophet Sallallahu had mentioned uh, some things that we exclusively as an ummah get information in regards to the Jal that previous nations weren't privy to. But uh, incredible how all the nations were informed of the Jal. Now just to clarify, I'm not actually going to do a talk on the Jal it's him, it, it, itself or himself. And the reason I'm not going to do that is because this is something that you all heard about. Uh, this is something that you've all hadith on the jal. Everyone's heard about them growing up, and these are out there already. Again, I'm trying to keep it to what's necessary here. So, what I'm going to speak about, I'm going to give you a heads up. So, as we go on this roller coaster journey, you can keep up, inshallah, or maybe not keep up, just get ready for the turns and the when to let go, <laughs> when to hold on. What I'm going to do is, I'm going to speak about the system that exists. For the Jal to flourish, for him to arrive, there has to be a system in place. And, and that system, what we'll do is we'll speak about some, some of the aspects of that system, more specifically in relation to the self. So for us to understand how the Jal will appear, it is important to understand that there will be a system, that one of the interpretations is the Jal is a system, one of the interpretations is that the Jal is a phenomena. Uh, and there's many modern interpretations like the Jal is the camera and the big brother and the one eye, the satellites and so on and so forth. And, and to be honest, it's probably an amalgamation of, of most of them. But the most common one is, is the Jal himself will be a particular person. But again, I, I don't really want to speak about them. What I want to speak about is that particular framework that we have. And this framework, I'm going to try to ex exclude from the framework maybe five or six key points. Now, I will speak philosophical at the start. So there will be what we would say is the philosophical or that you could say the philosophy of the job if i could say it like that and when i say philosophy i don't want anyone to freak out and think about falsafa what i'm trying to say here is that are the, the these are the foundations of that worldview now why am i speaking about that i'm not gonna this is not a philosophy class and nor is it a philosophy of the job class it's actually to understand that the world we live in has been designed and is predicated Upon minds that have thought And as they have thought They have thought in a manner To invite the Dajjal And to invite a a, 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 a a shaitani or satanic Worldview That things have to get, have to become Dajjalic in nature for that Manifestation to really take place Does that make sense? So you have to understand that Thought thinking was done. So when we say philosophy, when I'm saying philosophy, uh, uh, philosophy here, yeah, I'm, I'm, what I'm saying is, is the, is the thinking that was done. So for us to first understand the thinking, then I will, I will link it to specific uh, ways in which that thinking manifested, and then I will speak about, inshallah, if God permits, uh, the specific advice from the prophetic council in protection in relation to those things. And the reason I speak more philosophical is because. I can tell you the specifics, and I'll give you specifics. I can give you five of them, and you can go home and you can try to deal with five. But when, when Muslims, and Muslims were good at this, this is why all of our scholars were math, mathematicians. You always heard this, like logicians and mathematicians. The beauty of maths is that it teaches you the ability to see universals. The, and, and it's incredible. If you go to the UK, I don't know what it's like here for you guys, but in the UK, only the private schools, the kids get taught logic. In the standard schools, they don't teach logic. Why? Because they don't want them to think. You see, when you can think, you can see universals. A universal would be what are the two the different uh, the, the similar that's universal between the, these two these two things here is that they is that they are both plastic bottles. Now, if I speak about just this one, if my mind is not developed enough, I, I would think I'm not speaking about this. I would say plastic is dangerous. But if you can't understand that this is the same thing, even though it's a little bit different, because I've drank from this. 
essentially, it's the same thing. You have to understand essentially. But if you can't understand essentials, then you'll say, oh, he spoke about this, but this is different. This is in the case of the person who maybe listens to a, a lecture about the dangers of media and says, no, 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 I'm okay. You know, I don't watch TV, you know, and then bang, bang, bang. It's like, no, universally, it's the same problem. The gut is the same. <laughs> It's the same gutter. You just need to understand it comes in a new form now. It's actually, they train people to be so dumb now in, in logic is that's why they buy the new iPhones because it's the exact same thing. You know, I, I mean, just, you know, I, I recently looked at the Samsung uh, 24, S24 ad and all the, you know, they offered uh, AI is one of the key differences. And other than that, a, a better megapixel camera. Other than that, the spec was the same. And I thought how incredible that they will, you know, um, rinse people, they literally rinse people out of every dime that they've got uh, for the next sale and that has been designed from day one in school. No offense to you if you bought a uh, latest iPhone, I don't want you to feel too bad. Uh, if it makes you feel worse, I got an Android and an iPhone so you know we're all in the same boat. The boat's going down and we're all in it but hopefully we can uh, get, find some lifeboats. That's the point of this uh, class. I mean this is why we say you know in the morning salamun ala nuhum fal alameen inna kathalik nadzil mahsirin inna min ibadil mu'mineen the whole verse the, the three verses there is just fascinating because it just reminds you that there will be uh, the, the, there will be this madness that takes place and there is a arc of safety um and 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 for you to be at the arc of safety, you have to really develop a next level mindset to which you know you have to be a mahsin. Anyway, I, I definitely digress there. Point being is is that you have to be able to understand the philosoph philosophical foundations. If I give you those, inshallah, you can see them greater when you go back home. And so that's the aim here, inshallah. So that's why I said it'll be a bit of a roller coaster, but hopefully, I, I hope my uh, my teaching. Um, skills as a professional teacher assist us in uh, trying to break down they're not that difficult concepts to be honest with you so it's not going to be uh, hopefully it's not that that long of a class either inshallah so i do aim to try to finish it beforehand so as i mentioned there are the hadith in regards to the jal i mentioned just one of them here and i and this one really just highlights one specific aspect of the jal in which um we see that uh, that one of the things that the jal will have with him uh, is that he will be he will be bringing um, he will be bringing with himself a water. Uh, let me just find that specific hadith. Um, sorry, 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 sorry. Yeah, there's, there's things about Medina, the safety of Medina, and so on. But anyway, um, and so one of the the, the, tradi the traditions, uh, one of the Sahaba, when he was asked um, that uh, that that uh, he was asked by Hudayfa. Uh, bin al Yaman, that tell us about what you heard from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Abu Musa'ud said that uh, sorry, Hudayfa said that the Jah will appear and with him will be water and fire. That which people consider to be water will in fact be a burning fire, and that which will be, and that which people will consider to be fire will in fact be cool and sweet water. He who from amongst you happens to face him should jump onto that which he sees as fire, for that will be nice and sweet water. Right, so there's another variation of that hadith as well, kind of confirming that. That's a Sahih hadith. Now, just that one hadith that I've mentioned, there's many hadith as I mentioned uh, that there are referenced here. But that one, what is, what is it telling us? Fundamentally, is the inversion of truth and falsehood. That the whole, the whole schema is to invert what is seen as good and what is seen as bad. So people will see bad as good and good as bad. In the same manner, we have other signs of the Day of Judgment. Um, from the Hadith Jibrail, where we see that the slave girl will give is the slave girl will give birth to her mistress. That uh, that you will see that there will be an inversion of hierarchy, meaning that the parents will then be treated in a manner as to be uh, uh, treated in a way that, that as if they are uh, uh, lower in status, and that the children will have a higher status. And so this is like, you know, fundamental anarchy. That how do you start to flip this type of a reality? So, when we look at the Jal, uh, literally the Jal, his whole, uh, you know, the term is a deceiver, right? With the most common used terms. This I can give, we can go like through a whole list of things. But ultimately he's a deceiver. Is one of the, the translations of when we talk about the jal or you look at the essential uh, origins of the word is to cover uh, to cover uh, dirt with gold or even even manure crap to cover it with gold that is the 
ultimate philosophy of what the Jal is trying to create is there is this perspective that what he's offering people will look amazing, look like gold, but in reality it's absolute crap. And for us to understand this, we have to understand that what does the Jal particularly represent? His whole thing is to take people away from God. He is to present a new God, which will be obviously him himself. He will be presenting himself as a God. And the way he will do this is to present to people that which will be the most attractive to them. And so what we see in the, in, in the modern world now, this, this, uh, this, and we see this with the, the dollar bill and we see the eye and we see the pyramid and so on. I won't do a full arrivals video, but just a reminder that ultimately the modern worldview, what is known as the secular worldview, that is fundamentally what we're speaking about when we speak about the Dajjalic system. That those who have brought about this understanding of the new world order, they have the understanding that once we establish this as the new norm of living, then the Dajjal will be far easier for people to accept. So what does that fundamentally consist of? So there's going to be about five points that I'm going to mention now. The first is the secularization of the world. And what, what happens when you secularize the world? What is secularization? It's to remove the governance of religion. When you remove the governance of religion, now you have essentially uh, uh, the governance of man. Right? First you go from, from divine governance, now you have governance of man. That's the first thing of what, uh, what secularism does. When you start to have a system like this, what does it then produce? If you go and study any of this, and I'd recommend people to study, if you can have good, you know, you have, mashallah, really good teachers in the Bay Area, to be honest. You should actually start to study, because the modern world that we live in is, in, in principle, the first, you know, you could say the usul of the modern world, or the usul al-kufr, or the first aqidah point of the modern world, is secularism, is that, is the removal of God or the removal of religion from existence. So when you take it out of governance, you take it out of individual governance, meaning that your whole perspective of yourself now, you will not look to the heavens to define aspects of yourself, to make sense of yourself, but rather you will look at, if you take out God, who's left? Who will you look at? Other people or... Yourself, there's the only two ways you're going to go. Either I'm going to ask you, hey, um, do you know where my soul is? Right, right. I will ask you or I will look to myself. So this is the first thing that, the, that is the secularization. There's many different forms in which this comes about. But I just want to, I want to highlight, first of all, the secularization. And I'll go through all of these in more detail. Once you secularize, now there is no God in the picture. And so me and you are just trying to figure out this whole world. What this does is this begets and brings about and really just, you know, produces this incredible skepticism because now we're both freaking out. Who's got evidence for the soul? Right? So, so, so what we believed in, is it really true? This skepticism scares the crap out of people. It really did. And, and this is me kind of summarizing a, a, got a lot of philosophical movements here. But it starts to breathe skepticism. So people become ultra-skeptics. Along with that, so there's two things that have happened now. Along with this, these are all happening at the same time. They're all interlinked and intertwined. Some came a little bit before philosophically in history, in the Renaissance period. Some came a little bit after. There's different forms of these. The third thing that happens is you start to get now uh, once we have a difference of understanding of, uh, of of truth, right, which was which was reality, now we're questioning what is truth. So before, truth was what al haq right? It was Allah's name. When we take out whether you're from a Christian perspective or whatever perspective, you take out religion, then truth now becomes this tangible reality. This is what literally reality comes from. Reality comes from a Latin word which is realis, which means something that's just tangible. So now your reality can become a tangible thing, whatever you form, look at, like, you know, those um, balloons, I uh, made a puppy out of it. Well, you can start to make your reality whatever you want it to be. I mean, and this is not far-fetched because we see in the world around us, when so people are starting to redefine their own reality. You see what's happened there? You will always, this is an inevitable, this is like logical steps. You will inevitably get to that when we lose actual governance you see what we will then do is we will form our own governance our own governance will be either you pick it or i pick it and if we can find some you know if we can enslave him then why don't we both be the government and he's under us you see this is what starts to happen the nafs 
the nafs has no regulation because there's no government anymore. Because there's no government, nothing is now governing me. Nothing is stopping me or, or making me go forward except what will be my own whims and desires. So then what happens is now we start to now redefine truth. Therefore, there becomes this third thing, moral relativity. If you're making notes, well done. Because since I've been in the States and every talk I've ever done, there's been people be listening to all my classes and they've been making notes. There's a reason why they're the ones who are running the world in the way they are. So until Muslims actually turn up to classes and make notes, you know, so uh, but Alhamdulillah, for you, Allah's already given you notes. It's called a phone. So just, you know, try to make these notes if you can. It's up to you. But I, I recommend that. Really make them, become familiar with these concepts because these are the, these are the, foundations of the metaphysical frame of world that your children live in and you live in and if you're unaware of that then you're just a, you're just grazing in that farm that's what's going on here so it's it's a i'm not joking here that's why i said here. i'm not here to entertain a, a genuinely you know I'm, I'm i'm here to remind myself of the truths of this reality around us so the third thing is is then moral relativity the fourth thing then this pr brings about so now moral rel relativity means what means that you define your good how you want it to be and I define my good how I want it to be because we're both skeptics so we don't know what good is anymore. The fourth thing that this then br brings about is individualism that you have your own crew whoever wants to follow him they follow him and I have my crew whoever wants to follow me follows me. This individualism starts and if you don't like following us just make your own government and you can follow yourselves. Yeah? Probably remember the whole period of countries being born is a similar philosophy that was taking place Oh, can we have a flag as well? Can we have a flag as well? Well, we're different to them and everyone's making their own flags under the guise of independence and the guise of True humanity what's really being established is the re revival of tribalism especially in the Muslim world But anyway, let's not go talk about I don't want to talk about geopolitics I want to talk about personal relationships and I'll, I'll tell you how this plays into the home, because when the home can't get past these, the society is not going to nowhere get past any of these. The fourth thing, uh, sorry, the, are we in the fourth or fifth? Fifth, right? The fifth thing that this then brings about is an ultra materialistic perspective now. Sorry, the fifth thing, sorry, before we get to materialism, is rationalism. So now, because everyone's freaking out, what happened in the in in the, in the modern world that's created the world that we live in is then the, as they became skeptical they realized well you're concluding things i'm concluding thing, concluding things therefore i must have a mind and you have a mind therefore rational and reason becomes the godhead of everything right so rationalism that's where science survives so rush so rationalism comes about i'll tell you how this disturbs your home as well on this so everyone got makes sense here yeah? rationalism so once we've got rationalism, so people are now ultra thinking, where did people's feelings go? How did they make sense of their feelings? So this beget, this actually created a, a, a whole movement in philosophy, which was called romanticism. And I'm telling you something, when you figure out this, especially with those who are not married, you'll realize, well, you're not married. Romanticism. Yeah. And if you, and if you are married and, and you're not happy, this is it. Yeah. So for those more, maybe the millennial generation, you guys are. Uh, most affected by this uh, so romanticism so what happened was people wanted to feel but the scientist couldn't conclude love and truth and honor and courage and virtues so human beings started to define their own experiences of love their own experiences of truth of justice and so on this became a very scary path and i'll, and I'll go into this as well so those are uh, about six points, really the five, but the other two, the last one is uh, two, two like under the same. So rationalism and romanticism are basically the same thing. All right. It's the same thing, but for two different. One is basically ultra mind and one is ultra heart, meaning too much mind and too much heart. And I'll, and I'll bring this all back. So when you have a godless system, what was the first thing that we said that starts to manifest? is this secular worldview, yeah? The secular worldview, fundamentally, the whole idea is that governance is bad because the secular worldview came from get rid of the government and therefore you are your own government, this empowering notion that was established. This empowering notion in the modern self resulted that once man took out God from the picture, who was repl replaced as being God? The nafs. Right? The nafs would be replaced as the new God. 
because there's no governance, there's no reason why not to indulge anymore because there's nobody pulling us back. Remember, what did we say? Moral rel relativity. So if you say that's wrong, I'll say, well, you do you, buddy. I'm not harming anyone. Now you see these, I'm going to give you more of these one-liners that are actual one-liners that have shaped our whole world that people can consider it to be okay. And for the young people who are here, and there's not too many of you, but take this into your schools and, and be serious about this. That whenever anyone says to you this idea that, well, I'm not harming anybody, this is actually highly problematic because there is no such thing as, you know, you can also be right and I can also be right. There's, because once you start to, there's a degree of you, so there's partial, like there's your, your narrative and my narrative. But if you think your narrative is completely right and my narrative is completely right, then we will have a problem forever. This is where they have phrases like, uh, one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. No, he's not. But if you accept this, then you are accepting that, well, it's complicated. It's not complicated. You see how people are accepting this phrase? Because the worldview has designed them that there's not this. Now, when you start to, when you don't have anything that's right anymore, then you will fall for anything. And that is literally how the Jal will just sweep in. Because remember, once he comes on the scene, a third of the, the Muslims leave the faith. How do you think a third of them are going to leave? One third? You know what that is here? You can just count it here, what that is statistically, just with people in the mosque right now. One third goes, why? Because we have all been conditioned. And how many Muslims speak like this? How many Muslims speak with these types of terms? And I'll give you a few more of them as well. But, but ultimately within the home, I want to just bring it back to the context of, of your well-being and your relationships. When you take out governance, nobody is in charge of telling you what's good for you and what's bad for you. The first place that the child is conditioned and you were all conditioned because all the Disney movies did this, is that the, and all these TV shows and you can, what I'm going to say now, you'll all make a connection, is that who's the first governance in the home? Parents. And what is the depiction of parents in media? And who is the who is the biggest authority in the home? The dad. And is every dad in the, every dad in every TV show is a clown. He's an, he's actually portrayed as a fool. And this is the conditioning. So if you think that your kids can watch this stuff and they're not actually registering it and considering, it, you know, my, my own son came and like I try to keep uh, you know. So I'm from a Pakistani Kashmir background and my wife is Algerian. So we try to, she tries to speak Arabic and I'm trying to speak, you know, my, my dialect here yeah? and I could just about keep up myself. Uh, so I try to say to him, I say to him, Abu Jan, Abu Jan, he watched one show, one of the Omar and Ihana, Omar and Hana show. And he came and he, he started saying, he started calling his mom Ummi. He never says Ummi. The word, like just one show, not even a full show, like 10 minutes. He's like, he looked at me, he goes, daddy. I was like, daddy, what, where did you get daddy from? He goes, mommy. But subhanallah, this is the incredible. And if you know your stages of development, I mean, I, maybe I'll do the class on nurturing the child temperament. And I'll tell you, if you don't get the chance, if I don't get the chance to do it, really start to look at developmental stages because from, from, about, from about seven to about 10, maybe 11, is the stage of la'ib, which is play. But laib actually develops their taqlid, which is their ability to follow. Meaning that if they didn't play properly where they were following, if that child doesn't get good following and if that child is told to be a leader from 7 to 11, then you're going to have a real menace on your hands because this kid cannot take orders anymore. You see, this is why people don't like to follow uh, even schools of thought sometimes. You see, because they, they have not developed in their ability to listen and follow and the whole modern secular worldview designs you as the modern god so you have no reason to listen to the parent and to listen to the imam that's why everyone's got in fact secularism came off the back of uh, of um, institutionalized religion and that's why every person and i'm telling you i travel the world you know and uh, you know teaching classes but i'm telling you all of the children of the modern world, including all of us who have all got traces of these, they have such a difficult time with authority and with institutionalized anything. The moment it's institutionalized, in their mind, it is bad, which is so problematic because anything that develops over time, it will eventually become institutionalized. Institutionalized doesn't not equal bad, but therefore, what does this do? 
if if I grow up with this mindset, not only do you are, are your are, are your parents your worst enemies who are out to get you. Not only do you have that, you now have the matrix, which now you are ultra paranoia. Remember, I told you about skepticism. This is how it forms. You see, because now they're out to get me. No one's out to get you, but you. But it feeds the mind because because nobody actually cares for me. As in, nobody has vested interest. Even the parent is not considered to have vested interest in the child. So that's why then that child turns around and acts like the mistress to the to the to the mother. You see, this is how it's formed, and it's formed philosophically. You could read this; just read about how this formed, and so then you start to now get this this understanding that everyone's corrupt, and there's major trust issues. This is another big thing if you know about your you know, relationships and well-being and so on. A lot of people today have massive, massive trust issues, and a lot of that trust issue has been uh, generated. And, Cultivated by by understanding that the first ones you could you 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 trusted were actually against you in the first place. This is all problematic. You got to wait till that child either becomes a parent themselves or wait till they're forty till they realize oh everything my parents did did for me was good for me. But until they do that and they listen to all this garbage on Instagram and social media and YouTube, they will have a whole understanding that nobody gets me. And and this this modern notion, which I know 100%, a lot of you youngsters definitely, and maybe some of the older people have actually expressed this way. But oh, but I'm not like the rest. Of, I'm different. This uh, false understanding that you're you're different. How different are you really? This is the case of every guy who starts who, who does some, who does a who does a crime. Anyone who does a a, a a bad relationship, they all turn around and say, no no no, but we're different. We're different. This modern notion of we're different. What do you mean you're different? How different are you? But the whole the whole formula has made them to to be designed upon. You are now your own governance, and therefore you are now the the rule setter. And if your rules, who's setting your rules is going to be your own nafs. So you have to have authority. You have to understand that there is authority around you that is there to take care of you, and you have to have trust with that authority, whilst knowing that it's not going to be perfect. But just because it's not perfect does not mean it is oppressive necessarily. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I'm talking in the context of uh, the home. I'm not talking about you know your country, for example, right? That's the first thing. How obviously? How is that countered? What, what do you say? How would you? How would you? How would you counter that? How would you counter a secular worldview? How do you counter secularism? I'll, I'll ask you right now. Anybody? Just try to. I'll repeat it. Hmm. How do you counter this secularization then? In the how though? How do we do it in the house? In the house, outside the house, how? What's the first learning point? What approach do you take? Yeah, so which part of the basics of the core of Islam? Because I'll tell you, sister, a lot of people that follow, they think they're following the core of Islam and they're just regurgitating secular. You know, how, like how many psychologists, you, you guys all know this, especially like in the, the slightly younger generation, anyone who's on Instagram, how many psychological well-being models are fed to you with Islamic terms but are still secular frameworks? They, they, they just look Islamic with a few Islamic terms, but they're just still secular. They're not... Just because it says it's like the Coca-Cola phenomenon, you take Coca-Cola and slap Mecca-Cola and all of a sudden it's Islamic. What made it Islamic? Well, because it's got an Islamic term on it. So this, this is, so there's a lot of things like that. So it's not just about basics. Fundamentally, I'll give you the answer, is taqwa. It is the amount of taqwa one has, the amount of, literally, if, if secularism is to take God out of the picture, you literally have to do everything that brings God back into the picture. Therefore, anything that is taqwa, is taqwa related, God consciousness, and that from, will be from carrying your uh, dhikr beads with you. But fundamentally in your home, how do you, how do you counter the secularization? Is by having a, uh, a taqwa-filled home as best as you can. There, there's, this is the absolute minimum. So when you said go back to the basics, yes, sister, that is the basics. You got it. That is to get back to the taqwa. There will nothing that will counter secularization except the taqwa aspect. Because when you have taqwa, you have faith. Then the jal won't be able to get you. But if you, because it's la ilaha, the greatest the weapon of the believer, the in the fitna of the jal is what la ilaha illallah is your iman. The greater the iman that you have, that is your weapon at that point. But if you don't have that iman, you don't have that taqwa, you will fail.
So there's no escaping this except through by having taqwa. That's the first thing. Okay, we've only done the one thing. Should we keep going? So I'll do the second thing. The second one, what did we mention was what? Uh, yeah, skepticism, right? So, and skepticism and moral re relativity. So moral re relativity now, when you become skeptical, unfortunately, when you keep that secular worldview, so now this child is like, oh, my parents are out to get me, or the school is out to get me, or uh, I can't trust nobody, this is me against myself. What does that breed? It breeds all this notion, and the young lads definitely know about this. It breeds this understanding of what this idea now, this sick idea of leave that which does not serve you. This is things that all of you like, will have heard about this now. The people, I met a guy, mashallah, such a good brother, and he came to me and he said, you know, it's like I like spending time with you, but I don't spend time with anybody else who doesn't serve me. I looked at him and said, what do you mean serve you? Who are you that you should be served like that? You are the, the one who serves. You're the, you're the abd. You are, not, you are not supposed to have abd. You see, but if you understand that you're a follower of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then having followers wouldn't distract you. But if you don't remember you're a follower of the Prophet ﷺ and you live with your followers, this is, and if you look at YouTube, all of them have designed it. Facebook's designed like that as well now. It's changed that you have followers and people are following you. There's only one person who had the followers and they were the Sahaba, you know, and they were following the Prophet ﷺ. So that's the way our tradition goes. But once you have this moral relativity, now you are always right. Do you see this, this narrative now? Now the parent, you're against the parent and now you're always right. You would always be right because the world has trained you to understand that everyone's narrative is an equally fair narrative. And it's not equally fair. Does that make sense? It cannot be equally fair because both of them cannot be equally right in regards to something that would be a contradiction and it's called nonsense. That's literally the definition of nonsense. You also then start to breed moral relativity. I'm taking it from geopolitics, yeah, and, and, and ideological warfare to the home, to the individual. It then makes you also think, because you're always right, you can never be wrong. These two things are formed into people. You're always right and you're never wrong. That then leads into then, therefore, now what's going to happen is if I'm always right and therefore I'm not wrong and you're always right and therefore you're not wrong, then you do you and I do uh, and I, do I, right? I do my thing, you do your thing. These are the phrases that are formed. You would have never had this in a traditional society, in any traditional society, Muslim society, Christian society, any other society, this idea of you do you. In fact, the one who did their own thing, you know the first idiot, you know the word idiot? The first idiot was the first one who broke up fr broke up from the identity as in the group, you know, the group identity. The one who breaks off from the group identity and forms his own identity, that was the first idiot. Because they were like, why would you be so silly? Because you are clearly part of us. So the fact that you are separating yourself by just that one thing and therefore rejecting what you're a part of, this is actually the first, this was uh, literally, you could see, the origins of what idiocy comes from. So... This moral rel relativity where you're right and I'm wrong and you do your and me do me, this creates a society of idiots because everyone's got now their own worldview predicated upon what I think is right. This is my way and I have my followers and I do my own thing. This concludes, and I, I, subhanAllah, we saw this in a morning TV show in the UK. I don't know if anyone saw this on, on Instagram or TikTok or something. They, this kid said, my mom is irrelevant. It was on a morning because my mom is irrelevant. The guy said, why is your mom irrelevant? He goes, she has no followers. And he said this with complete certainty. You know, what would be the equivalent of his Iman? <laughs> he, he had like, he was a strong believer in nonsense. That's how strong he was. Yeah, he goes, because she has no followers. And that was a worldview that he was designed in. Don't forget that this is the same worldview that we're all exposed to. You see? And 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 so and so then then and then and then you read Maulana Rumi and you just and you read it as this secular worldview where beyond the field of right or wrong I'll meet you there. No, <laughs> you cannot leave the field of right or wrong because you are a morally bound person. But when your morality is your morality and my morality is my morality, you do you and me. I do and I do my thing. And this will form in the home where you see people living these ultra separate lives within the home where your identity was one under the surname of your grandfather or your father and now everybody's doing their own thing everyone's got their own device and i do i eat 
lunch or breakfast at my time. When we were in Yemen, there was one of our teachers, he studied there 10 years, a full-blown sheikh now. He, he, when I asked him, and he's a converted to Islam, I, I studied a text, one of Imam al-Adad's texts under him. And I asked him, like, well, what was it really that pushed you over the edge in Islam? He said, uh, he said, my Muslim neighbors ate together. He said, my family never ate together. This guy left his, what well, the deen that he was from and joined Islam because they ate together. When you stop eating together, the system that doesn't allow your family to eat together, the human being inside them will go to where communal eating is. And I'm telling you, the modern form of that is these watch parties. And those who know, know. Some of you, well, majority of you will not know what I just referenced there. But there are people who now will watch a TV show with a watch party online on YouTube with 15,000 15, other people who are isolated from their homes. But I have my digital community. So I'm going to watch it with a digital community. And they're not eating with their own family. But now they're having their own times because you know what, Sunshine, you just eat whenever you wake up. And when you eat together, you increase in love. So when you stop eating together, what's going to happen? I'm telling you now, I, and I've tr trust me, tried and tested method. If there's anyone you're trying to do, like you're trying to outreach, trying to do that, well, mashallah, you're all good people. You're here on a Friday night in the mosque. You're already sorted. So this uh, talk that I'm doing to myself, I hope that you can do it to yourself when you're with your friends as well, yeah? Because you guys are in safe hands. If you're on a Friday night in the mosque, you're in a good place. What was I saying? Try it. Yeah, test it. If there's anyone you're trying to connect with, tr listen to me carefully, all right, lads, yeah? you got a friend of you you're trying to connect to with. Just eat with that friend. Just eat with them. Yeah? Just, just pay for the meal and just eat with them. I'm telling you, you are highly impressionable. Even your, even these grown adults here are impressionable. You think all of you designed you to pick, you know, you actually picked your own clothes that you're wearing. You were, you were conditioned to wear the clothes that you're even wearing right now. That that's how. That's why Ibn Atayla says that the heart that Allah's made this heart like a soft lump of flesh to remind you how impressionable and delicate you are. This is our reality. The, Pro the Prophet some said that a person is on the deen of their khalil, of their friend. You know what? Deen doesn't just mean religion here. Deen also has a meaning. Deen means a transaction. That's why Medina is the city, because in the city you do transactions. That's the old word for Medina, like what Medina literally means. So when you, do, when you have deen, what does deen mean? It means what you trade your life for. That's your deen. So just because you say it's Islam, how, I, how we can work out our deen is to check what do I trade my breathing for? What do I trade my life for? And the best way to know that is when you wake up, the first thing you think of, if the first thing you check is DMs, that's your deen. If the first thing you check is emails, that's your deen. If you first thing you, that's why uh, 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 Mom Janaid said that the, that Whenever you have a calamity where your mind goes first, that's your ma'abud. That's what you're worshipping. That moment. And where your mind goes first, that's, your, that's who you're worshipping really. The Prophet some says every one of you wakes up and he is a uh, trader. He's a vendor, vendor for his soul. Either he trades it to free or he trades it for the hellfire. You will be trading it for something. You have a deen no matter what. You got to consider what deen are we, are we opening ourselves up to. So that moral relativity, as I was mentioning here, that this idea of everyone's right, everyone's wrong, this becomes highly problematic. So, and then what happens is, then you say, no, no, I choose to delay prayer time. No, prayer time is set. There's objective relativity, not <laughs> objective morality, not relative. So because it's the prayer time set, Inshallah, I will break for the prayer and then uh, I only did a couple of them. So I have more juicier ones to come, Inshallah, if you benefited. May Allah give us all tawfiq, Inshallah. Jazakallah khair. So nice to have you back at MCC. Uh, so uh, we will break for Isha prayer. Uh, we'll come back. At okay. All right. So we covered the secular. So that's essentially the godless society, right? Secular doesn't really, shouldn't really be a separate one. That's the foundation of all of these. Moral, moral relativity right into the individual, straight into the individual's worldview. So once I am my own governing body, I am now my own law setter. 
right? So because those authorities like parents, etc., etc., were the, the, the wrong, bad people, uh, now I know better. This is the phenomenon of I know better, me, myself, and I. Yeah. Then the skepticism, now this is really plays into the mental health because now what you've done is, is you've created hidden narcissism in every person. <laughs> yeah. On top of that, you've also created, so if these kids are not careful, they will be, comp- I mean, it, it's not the kids, I mean, this is already established in, 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 the, in the world we live in, where you just have purely self serving living. That the whole living is self service, had that to the point where even the greatest of pleasures are rooted in and around the self. That the more I can have, the more I can bank, the more I can please myself, the better and more happier I will be. In our tradition, that's the nafs al-amara bisu on steroids. Yeah. It's, it's the worst sickness you're going to find. So not only do you have these obsessed, uh, these obsessed uh, narcissistic uh, 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 minds that you're creating, you're also creating these highly anxious individuals because when you have taken governance, when you have taken law, when you have taken morality, right and wrong, when you have taken it out of the picture, and you have also introduced, if you also have introduced the skeptical aspect of the experience, which is the, you know, what's true anymore, you will absolutely create anxious beings. Crazy levels of anxiety. That anxiety will be because I don't know what to do. Because you know why do you, why do we like why does everybody love when they say you know back to basics keep it simple everyone loves that because it's easy you tell me what to do I do it like salah is such a beautiful reset because you drop everything and you go and pray it's like the best therapy therapeutic activity you can do is it cures your anxiety quite quickly but if you do not and you stay in that world where you're not praying and you're just procrastinating and you're just waiting and waiting and waiting, the anxiety will build up. Look at how much this is affecting the mind automatically just by the secular worldview. And look how they're all linked. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Bismillah. Now I'm going to comment a little bit on the individual, but there's one more here. Ah, yeah. Now, this class essentially is ideological warfare training, if you can even say that without getting flanked. But, <laughs> but it's, it's, that's what we're speaking about here. When we're speaking about the philosophical foundations, we're speaking about the ideological foundations. Now, when these one, two, three have formed, the individual now, as we've just mentioned, so we've mentioned the anxiety. One day I'll make this into a nice graphic and everyone can stick it up in their rooms and cure their wor- worries. <laughs> in the center, we just put Allah. All right. um, anxiety, what else did we say? Narcissism, and what else? What else did we say? Obsession. Yeah. So these, this is now just three of the things that have formed. Um, of course, once the individual it, it also becomes overly, um, overly uh, zealous now, because everything is rooted in me, myself, I, uh, the nafs al amara. Uh, I have cookies. I want all my cookies, and I also want your cookies. And guess what? I can take everybody's cookies here. This actually is part of the anger issues that you find raging in so many people. And let me just bring in as well. Look, what did I tell you? This is, when, when I said it's a, a model of universals, what that means is give me a scenario in life and I can run the whole thing through it and I'll tell you the most common problems in that scenario. For example, marriage. Shall I choose marriage? Marriage. When you have a secular uh, mind frame of marriage, the, religi- the, the taqwa is taken out of the marriage experience. So you're getting married for the sake of the person. You should never get married for the sake of the person. <laughs> this is the first problem. Because you get married for Allah's sake, if you get married for that person's sake, and that person will let you down, that's just depression loading. Is depression pending, yes or no? You see how obvious that is. That's why if you listen to, there's a wonderful talk called Rights and Responsibilities of Marriage by Sheikh Hamza, and the half of that talk is all taqwa. 
You listen to half of that lecture for three hours and you're thinking, where's the rights and responsibilities of marriage, right? Fascinating because half of it is taqwa. Hey, uh, along with that, um, if people haven't studied their, their, fiqh, their law of fiqh, then in that marriage, there's no law setter. So your way and her, uh, like her way and, and, and his way is now equal way. So they're just fighting and it's like, who's going to compromise and why should you compromise? Because there's no authority or reason to compromise. And then, and uh, not only do you have, uh, the, not, 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 not just that, you also have a problem with authority. So now she, the moment she thinks she sees an authority here, she is out because her whole upbringing has been Disney, which is break free and, and you know, uh, marry the street rat. Right? Marry the street rat. But the laws forbid marrying the street rat. Aladdin, if you're wondering. Um, but, but you see, she's been conditioned into this thing, which is break free from the governance because it doesn't allow me to truly be blah, 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 blah. I mean, these are the same philosophical foundations of all your wonderful movements in, in and around these areas. It's the same thing. It's philosophically and meaning ideologically in its root. It's the same thing. Anyway, and then there's more. I'll get to that a bit later if you want. If you remind me, I'll, I'll do that more on the marriage stuff. But anyway, so we're just trying to do the home for now. So we've spoken about the problem, the child's response, and obviously one's mental mental health. Now, what happens now to the individual? Who does this individual become? I mentioned those mental health issues. They will manifest when this goes unchecked. Okay? This, when this goes unchecked, this stuff will manifest. In the Islamic tradition, there was no separation, you could say, between the mental and the spiritual Ultimately, you could almost argue that the mental states were absolutely linked to one spiritual state. Yeah. Anyway, so when you look at uh, the modern individual, what 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 modern person does this create? It creates in the world of the young lads. I, I wish they stayed. Um, I guess my jacket wasn't cool enough for them. Uh, this idea of the main character syndrome. You know about the main character syndrome, right? So this is a phenomenon that is very common in, amongst the young people now. Where the main character is essentially when you play a game, it's subhanAllah, like now the virtual reality <laughs> dictates real reality. So they take concepts from the video game and apply it to the real world. So they say that be the main character in your life. You are the main character. And everybody else is what? NPC. A non-playable character, as in they're so irrelevant, they're not an actual, uh, they're just code, they're irrelevant, you can shoot them and nothing will happen to them, they'll just be respawned. This is this is actually how crazy and how bad it gets, and all these young lads know entirely what I'm speaking about here. Not only do you, what also then happens is now everyone's digital avatars, this obsession with like, how does my IG look? Do I have a Bitmoji? Blah, blah, blah. And I, again, I'm, look, I'm not anti-internet and anti- and, and everybody deactivate your Instagram accounts, yeah? My point is, is that these things should never be, you should never be on any of these things unchecked. That's the point. You should never be on any of these things unchecked. But but if you go in unchecked, if the modern individual forms unchecked, your your Instagram account now becomes your digital shrine for the, for the new God which is the self, Audhu Billah. You're not the star of your own show, you have your own TV channel, it's called your WhatsApp status or your Instagram status and you, you know, blah, 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 ta-da. And it completely goes against uh, the idea uh, in, in our tradition where of, of khidma. Like khidma has no place in this modern frame. They, like why would you do khidma? Have you ever tried to explain khidma to like, uh, you know, people who are not familiar with the Islamic faith and like they're so puzzled like, why would you, you know, or volunteering, but why volunteer? To what degree would you volunteer? Especially when you go above and beyond, like some of the beautiful people here. Um, and then you're also offered a very subjective worldview. This subjective worldview, I'm not going to go too much into, but if I was to go into it, it would basically show how this modern sense uh, uh, forms, which is, well, according to me, yeah, or well, in my opinion, you know these types of phrases. Yeah, well, while I'm seeing, what I'm getting, me, 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 my, 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 as in, as if your subjective experience has a greater understanding of what the actual situation is. Does that make sense? 
So people's own direct experience forms and dictates reality. You know, that is just, just literally the foundations of bigotry and racism. I saw one Mexican guy do this and another Mexican guy, therefore all Mexican guys do this. You see what's happened there? I saw one Pakistani do this, another Pakistani, therefore all. So this is a really poor, poor reasoning. So you have limited or partial truths that sound very exciting, but they will be long-term highly problematic. But they will always sound very exciting. Why? Because they are subjectively true to the direct experience. They, oh, yeah, that, yeah, 100%, I know that. But actually, is there any real depth there? This then leads into what we call this this uh, term of nihilism, which is that nothing has meaning now. I'm telling you, all of those depressive, suicidal type thoughts, they all come off the back of nothing having any meaning anymore. There's no reason, there's no greater reason to. You see how the, just <laughs> this godless worldview has impacted one's mental psyche to this degree. You're not just uh, only you're a narcissist or, a, you know, and subhanAllah, you know, there's a, I don't know how it is in America, but in the UK, you know, the amount of people that are navigating something themselves. You know, I did a class. Some of you know about the, one of the main classes that I teach, the Knowing Yourself class. There was a lady who came and she said, oh, you know, really helped me. I figured out my mesaj and I'm just so much at peace with who I am now. And I said, yeah, good on you, sister. And she goes, no, you don't understand. Six months ago, I was suicidal. So I said, oh, you know, sorry to hear that. I said, just take your time and, you know. Then I seen her six months later and she said, oh my gosh, where the start the workshop changed my life. I'm a life coach. I said, sister, you were suicidal six months ago. How, how did you become a life coach? Six months later, I saw her. She has an academy where she's training other life coaches. Join me on my healing journey. <laughs> That's the first flag, red flag there because she's still healing. You know, I was, uh, subhanAllah, I was on the, we have a literature festival in the UK. Maybe I prayed for this. I didn't realize I prayed for this. But I always wanted to understand, uh, it sounds weird, but it's not really weird. But I really wanted to understand what goes on in the mind of a drag queen. You know what a drag queen is? Yeah, everyone knows a drag queen. And uh, so, I'm, uh, so I'm at the literature festival, I'm speaking to my missus, and I'm talking about half of this stuff, this is normal conversation. <laughs> I do my wife's head and she's like, give me a break. And uh, we're talking, and then literally next to me, I just looked to the side, and there was literally a drag queen, a dude getting ready. So he was dressing up. So, so I looked over, and I said, oh, I'm sorry, I must have been speaking loud. He said, no, 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 I find it really fascinating what you were talking about. I said, all right. I said, uh, so what do you think about it? He said, no, I, I, I can definitely resonate. A lot of it resonates. You know, I can see. He goes, see, I've been on my own journey. I said, oh. So then I, so I thought, this is a good chance to ask. I said that. Can I ask you a question? Because yeah, I said, why do you do what you do? And he and he goes, he goes, you want to know why? And then he just pointed somewhere where he had like a bruise, and then here, and then another one. He showed me like three or four bruises. He goes, you know, I was abused. I wasn't allowed to be who I am, and um, so I'm, I'm healing. So I read stories to kids. This is part of my healing journey. And I just looked and then my, my wife just said to him, it's interesting you said your healing journey and not your healed journey. As in, how is it working out there? Like the fact that you're doing this whilst you're still navigating things clearly shows that this isn't the appropriate response to have. But, it, but it's the same philosophical thing where people are just getting one dopamine hit and now all of a sudden I'm out to save A, B and C. It's like, just chill, slow down. So this is this is what I was talking about at the start, this phenomenon of all speaker, how exciting to be a speaker, is a curse to be a speaker. So you should read all the billah from that. Anyway, so this this worldview where nothing has meaning anymore, this is what they call nihilism. And unfortunately, you know, this is when now everything is removed of meaning. This is something that, you know, you might want to give him a good old poetry session with with uh, your wonderful Stad Feridun John, um, to really bring some life into into the form to show the meaning in things. Otherwise, why be good? You see, this whole ideology leads to why be good. This is the epitome of this is uh, Simpsons and Rick and Morty and all this. This is what they. This is what it concludes. This is what it's all about. This is what it's built upon. Even uh, one of the episodes, I, I remember he, well, the, the character, he then says, he's about to die and he says, God, if you're true, you know, save me. 
and then he gets saved and he says, you know, he just swears at God and he carries on. And it just it's just a summation of the of the because you see what they see this how is this presented? Like I'm making really deep uh, deep philosophical points, kind of summed up. Maybe been a very maybe I'm doing an injustice. I hope not. Um, but this is this is not presented to you as hey, welcome to the Jalik worldview. This is presented as what humanism. This is presented as oh, I'm just be, just being human. This is what it means to really be a human. That's what all these you know these actors and all this. This is how they. This is the reason why they accept and propagate this whole framing. Anyway, and then you have the the rationalism aspect of it. The rationalism aspect basically starts to conclude the world to be purely mathematical data observation. So this so truth is not truth. What we just project is what truth is. This is what it starts to create. So therefore. You know, who care? Who cares whose scarf this is? You see, this scarf is very dear to me because it came from a very special teacher. But according to my scientific brain, that's completely irrelevant to the to the reality of this, right? My scientific brain, but but my uh, my taqwa ihsan says, do you know that this can heal? You know, <laughs> this can heal like Yaqub <laughs> Right, the, it, it, you know, it, it cured his eyesight. Yusuf alayhi salam shirt, it cured his eyesight. Why? Because of true meaning that exists in things. But if you take that out, what are you left with? So you create these rationalists where now people are doubting any greater uh, uh, beauty and greater meaning in things because oh, it's just a table. Chill out. What's what's the big deal? It's just a book. What's the big deal? These have become the fra- the phrases. Because the beauty has been reduced because somebody's been doing too many science and math classes. And, and what that also concludes is what is that your existence is, oh, it's not that deep. You're just a, you could have been anyone. You could have had blonde hair. It's random selection. You see, your existence gets concluded as random selection. Whereas in our tradition, it's not random selection. You are the, uh, the, the result of how many beautiful, pure unions. You are... You carry the name not just of your father, but in that your grandfather and him and him and him and him and him. Survivors and warriors and legends. That's who you are. How can you ever have low self-esteem? Well, welcome to the Jalik mindset where you are just another number. Whereas according to the more traditional mindset, like when you go to traditional worlds, you start to experience this and you go to Yemen and they say, what, you know, who is your grandfather? And then you're like, you know, you write his name down. What tribe do you belong to? Tribe? Uh, I don't know if I belong to a tribe. <laughs> then they're like, Britani. <laughs> Your new tribes. Then you're like, no, 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 I'm Mughal, I'm Mughal. <laughs> uh, Subhanallah. But this is, this is what it creates. This is the effect of the, of the, the Jalik mindset on one self-esteem. So all these kids now are not just panicking and now are measuring themselves for material success. Materialism is also formed. And then the other thing is, is then how does love and how does goodness and how does excitement and how does all those beautiful feelings, where do they get categorized? Because science doesn't categorize them, does it? So what they did was then they started to say, well, the greatest feeling will be in the individual's material expression because the individual is material and the individual knows what it needs most. And therefore, my highest pleasure will be a greatest uh, manifestation of my personal material meaning most money most beautiful x y and z and that would be my greatest pleasure of happiness reducing it down to receiving and not giving but anyone who knows anything about pleasure is that the greatest pleasure far great if i have cookies for myself i'll i'll be happy at the start and then i'll feel a bit sick but if i give all my cookies away i'll sleep hungry but i'll have a very full heart won't i and that's the truth because the real service is in that. That's a nafs al And inshallah, you become so free of cookies. You say, what cookies? After having given them all away, that's called nafs al Yeah, That's the highest level. But this is all nafs al bisu. And guess what? His su and his su and his su and everybody else is evil. All just thrown into and you are just amara. They say you do like a computer. You just get at the command of all of this. And so even Layla and Majnu, and all these beautiful concepts that represented divine love. And this really happened, by the way. They took all of this and repackaged it in the form of Bollywood movies and Hollywood movies. And people's whole direct experiences of love are formed of stories. 
stories that they were for the sacred, and because classically no one ever read Layla Majnu for Shazia next door, right? It was all for sacred and beyond, but now it got reduced to material and experience. And that's why the highest pleasure in, in what's shown in this worldview is just a moment of material happiness. SubhanAllah, how, how sad. <laughs> We're sacrificing that. And our traditions, uh, classical tradition, sacrifice was the greatest. So, after having gone through all this, and the beauty is, yes, this is a little bit complicated, but uh, it's not that complicated. But what we can see, and then obviously image-based society, so not only do you have now the, the, the main character syndrome and, and NPCs and so on, you also then have the individual shrines and everyone's measured from what's, what's seen and what's apparent and what's cool and, uh, you know, how many sneakers do you have as if that's the greatest uh, no offense, I know it's a big culture here, apparently it's popping up in the UK, but it's just fascinating that, you know, anyway, yeah, I mean, just, I, it fascinates me, uh, but because, the, the, the remember, part of the Jalik system is to flip the script, so you see, the Jal wants a man to be like a woman and a woman to be like a man. That's part, remember the first hadith we showed was the fire as the water and the water as the fire. It's showing you inversion of realities. So where the man originally was like, you know, he was out to, you know, like one of the best things that all these young men, if you boys haven't done this yet, make sure you do this in your life is sacrifice the animal. You will never feel a greater masculine moment in your whole life than when you sacrifice the animal. But if you're like, blood, oh no, <laughs> you know, this, this is fitra's violation, fitra being distorted. So, inshallah, go. I hope uh, some of the, old, you know, we got, I think, uh, one of the Kai tribe members at the back, mashallah, he's got a nice hat. You know, I'm sure he sacrificed a few animals in his time. You know, wear a hat like that if you just sacrifice an animal. And so, inshallah, he will, you know, start something like that. I'm sure you guys can start to bring this restoration. And these all these mosques should be starting to, you know, look at how we can restore these types of things. This is real life, you know. You weren't supposed to be like this. You stay doing, you know, computers like this, and then you drive your little car like that, 90 miles per hour, building your negative charge. Yeah? What do you, what do you think you're going to be like? Then you go get married. Look at You look like a puppy. <laughs> hold me. Huh? You were supposed to hold. The man is, he's the holder. She wants to be held. Now they got him saying, hold me. And she's like, all right, come here. Let me hold you as well. You see, it's comical, but it's actually sad. We're only crying, we're only laughing to cry there to hide the tears. And then the and then the brothers buy sneakers. Here's my sneaker collection. Oh, it's fascinating. I really I don't like to hurt people's feelings. I don't like to hurt people's feelings. So if you really, if you really like them, just to get, get a few of your really nice ones and sell the rest. <laughs> you know. <laughs> You know, you you know, get a part-time job somewhere and earn some real money and give it to your mom. And, you know, the real uh, restoration of what it means to be. Anyway, so let's go. Let's go through some of these now. We'll bring in the prophetic answers for these. So the first one for secularism is always going to be taqwa, taqwa, taqwa. There's a reason why they all carried the sibhas, the tasbis, the old school fidget spinners. Yeah, <laughs> they, were the, they were the original ADHD things. Yeah. You just have a tasbih wherever you go, la, 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 la. Yeah? Because you need something, you see? You can never be mindless. They have cry about mindfulness. <laughs> yeah? You, you can never be free of things. You always, you need a reference point. So you got to have anything that's going to restore. So that's why I say to you all, you all in safe hands, because you're in the mosque on a Friday night. This is one of the big miracles of our time. Yeah, so really, especially you guys. You know, well done, man. May Allah bless all of you young lads, you know, being here. And I hope you're here because you want to be here, not because your parents told you to be here. But still, I'll take that over you not being here at all. Yeah? But but get to that point where you can be here because you want to be here. The second thing, moral relativity. The only thing that will reinforce objective relativity will be your studies and your aqidah and your fiqh. And I'm telling you now that nothing else will establish a common place of what truth is, constant truths. You know, people even get anxiety from Netflix. You know this. People's food is getting cold while they're trying to, but they're panicking on what to watch. Isn't that incredible? The, the fallacy of choice. 
as if you need a hundred options. The, all these old school people will tell you life was better when we had five channels. <laughs> you know, and what does this do? Now you be in your room and watch your channel and I'll watch mine in this room. Anyway. And then the, the, the women, at least the women back in the day, they watched the drama and the boys watched the action channels because the fitras were intact. Now the modern boys are watching drama. And the, and, the, and the modern women are shown to us as action women. All these modern movies have not done that, right? You've got this stick thin lady taking out a full SWAT team of 50 highly trained professionals. And everyone's like, oh, that's, a, that's literally the Jalik lie to show you something as is false. And now all these sisters are there weightlifting. <laughs> you know, I'm not saying don't go gym, go gym. Yeah. What I'm saying to you, you know, is just consider while the framing so you're not going into any of the extremes. Because the point is this. Anything that this has to offer you, the insan al-kamil, the Prophet ﷺ already had to offer you. So if, if secularism gives you empowerment... Iqbal already told you what your empowerment is. There's no bigger there's no bigger independence than for you to be independent of dunya and dependent on Allah. That's what Hasbun Allah wa Ni'mal Wakil or Alayhi Tawakkiltu is. That He is my Wakil. So when somebody gives you beef, you say, What does that mean? It means He is my defense. So you don't say talk to the hand. Say so talk to Allah, He's the defense. So this is what so when you get that when you get you learn your deen, you have actual morality and you don't have to have a shaky one. The skepticism will only be uh, uh, dealt with with Iman. All modern insecurities will be taken care of by having a security. I'll give you an example. Imagine you got a nose and you don't like your nose, and you say, Oh my gosh, I got the worst nose. If you remember, you see, in the modern world, what people do is they have a jacket and they say, what are you wearing? And then they, they give the brand name. Oh, it's Prada. Yeah, as if that makes it okay. Like, you see the modern gods. Yeah. So, the, so, so what's, the brand, what's the brand name of your nose? Who made it? Who designed it? Allah. It's because you're worth it. <laughs> So you, so you now, when you, so when you look in the mirror, you say, Allah, oh Allah, as you've made me beautiful, make my character beautiful, and you reinforce that I have the best nose because God made it. And you, and it takes real strength. It takes a real, real mujahid strength level to be like, do you know this is the best nose because Allah made it, and there's no other nose I'd rather have. Do you know that that level? The only security you're ever going to get is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nothing will cater for your insecurities. And if, and if this hasn't shown you, it's an age of insecurities. And people are just freaking out everywhere. So that will only be dealt with Iman. Iman literally means to tie yourself down. You know, like, um, you see this? You know, this, you see, it, it's not, it can't go too far, can it? Why? Because aqada, aqida literally ties you down. Now that's that's what you, that's how you roll. That's what you're about. That's your principles. No one can waver you on that. The kind of strength like Mark Max level strength. Bang. Try it again. You think I'm phased? Right. That. See that there. That's what we're trying to talk about here. Rational, romantic. They say your feelings and your greatest happiness is moments of pleasure that you just gather. There's no greater pleasure that you can gather except in the hidma. And in there, that none of you truly believes until you love for your brother what you love for yourself. Right? This is all, th these will be taken care of with ethar, preference over the next person. And I'll tell you young lads as well, yeah? You won't know this until you live it. You won't know what it truly means, what it truly means for you to have true pleasure until you have served. If you have not served, you will never understand what it means to really Understand what will fulfill the void. The void is only fulfilled by service, by khidmah, always. That's how, you, that's how you still have romanticism. Then you still love your family and you still love your wife and you still love your people and your son and whatever. But you love them for a far greater reason, not just for their, their sake alone. Because guess what? They're going to let you down as well. Yeah. yeah. 
read Imam Ghazali's uh, Alchemy of Happiness for more details. He literally says in there, you know, when you, your body's being lowered into the grave and you hear your wife and child crying, are they crying for you or for what they used to get from you? Right? So don't get too connected to them. <laughs> it just reminds you just Allah. And from Allah, everyone's bearable. But without Allah, why should I listen to you? You see, for you, for you kids, don't start that conversation. Just listen to your parents. Okay, rational. So we have in our, in our tradition, a place for our mind. Right? Your mind is your aql that allows you to navigate the inner kingdom. So Imam Ghazali says that you have the inner sheikh, you have the pig and you have the dog. Right? The dog is your action. When we, right? That's your, that's your dog. But the, the dog will take orders from the sheikh. If you learn, the dog will be in check and he can make sure the pig doesn't eat too much. But if the sheikh doesn't know, if the sheikh doesn't teach the dog, the dog is going to end up chasing the sheikh. So your intellect is chased by your passion, uh, by, your, by your, your own will. And the inner pig just grazes forever. And it just eats all day. This is what Ghazali says. So you got to use your mind by seeking knowledge. Nothing will change the world. You know, uh, we, we live in a sad time now because, you know, Palestine and everything that's going on. In, in Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jalani's time, they said to him, they said, what are you doing teaching in a, in a mosque? Do you not see? And he was talking about Tazkiyah and purification, you know, and, and they said, do you not see that Palestine is in the hand of the non-Muslims? What are you doing teaching this stuff? And he's, and he's, and, uh, uh, but he was on a long vision, you see. He knew that the, the change won't come out there unless we change at a deeper level, at a, at a personal level. You see, when you establish, deal with this, the change will happen. And what happened? Uh, within a hundred years, who was one of his students of, of, of that was Salahuddin Ayyubi, who not only was he a Kurdi, he was a Qadri. He wanted to be a scholar all of his life. And then when the order came, bang, now when you have Iman proper, you don't get wavered. These things won't get you when you don't, when you, when inside they don't exist anymore. You freed Palestine within, then they can't, they can't buy you out. Why is all our Muslim countries, then they're not showing up? Because they, they've been bought out. And, you know, and we can't look at them because we need to ask ourselves, where are we bought out? You see, and then we have, so these two are taken care of, taken care of. So ultimately it's seeking knowledge. And then your individual actually becomes rich. As the Prophet said, true, true ghina, true richness is not richness of things, but to be rich in the soul. Um, Sayyidina Ali said, it's not that you don't own anything, it's that things don't own you. So Sheikh Yaqubi said, make sure you make dua that, oh Allah, put lots of money in my pocket, but don't put a penny in my heart. Fantastic, huh? So, you know, I was doing a, I did a podcast in Australia and one of the guys was like, Brother Sark, you know, your classes, it's like people get a lot of benefit in this world and the next world. It's such a, a groundbreaking approach. I said, what are you talking about groundbreaking? In the Quran, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana. We want good in this world and the next world. And Islam will give you good in this world and the next, next world. And don't tell me that Mark X wasn't an amazing individual. And he was free of all of this. That's where true superstars are. Not the ones who just self-serve. Image-based societies, you just realize, never judge of physical outward. The Prophet ﷺ said, Inna Allah la yanzur ila surikum wa la ajsadikum, wa lakin yanzur ila qulubikum wa amalikum. God does not look at your forms, rather He looks at your hearts and your actions. So, so you never judge. So, so, so go on social media, do what you got to do, but don't live on there. It should be a never an actual extension of who you are. Never. And these Gen X have learned anyway of the millennials. Um, fascinating. Materialism again, that's what Zuhud is. It's that the material doesn't own you. The first ghazwa in Islam was what? What was the first battle in Islam? Badr. Are we not all fighting battles every day? The first battle taught us the first principle of the believer in battle. What's that? Never measure by outward material. Because if we measured by outward, Badr wouldn't have happened. But we didn't measure by outward. That's the Prophet showed us. You don't measure by. They got more people than us. It doesn't matter. Don't worry about technological warfare. They got more. They got bigger guns. Don't worry about bigger guns. Yeah, because when you got the faith, yeah, what happens? You see Palestine. You see, you see Jannah at the barrel of the enemy's gun, right? That's the level you form. That's what happens when we develop that. And then 
We are the complete, the, tradi the only tradition that's the complete opposite of nihilism. We have a thousand unlimited meanings and indications to God, even in this, even in this USB wire, where there's a, a thousand signs of Allah. We will, we never let this become meaningless. Now, in this class, this wire has become an alam, has become a whole world. You know why? Because a alam is the tool to come to know God. And this is the instrument in this class. So this is now partially a sacred USB wire. <laughs> that's how profound Islam is, that everything is venerated. And that's how you become an incredible uh, muhsin. Because everything is just Allahu Akbar. Huh? Then you, then you, uh, then what you end up doing is uh, you build blue mosque, you build Al Aqsa. You, that's what you build because now the sacred stone that no one will ever see. You know, the next time you go to Turkey, go to the wudu area. You know, this would be a good sign of when the Muslims are making a comeback. Check the wudu area. Yeah, because when you go to Turkey, if you, do you guys know what I'm talking about? When you go to the wudu, you know they're making wudu. If you look under the 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 the, the little mini domes that they have, they have the most incredible designs. And, and who's ever going to look there? But you didn't do it for the people, did you? And you do it for God. You're creating excellence the world has never seen before. That's why there was no, there was never uh, great armies and, and, and civilizations like the Muslims and the believers. So that's how we can see how the Jalik worldview will take us apart. And all we need to do is be regular in our dhikr and taqwa, study and seek knowledge. And if you do those two things, everything else you'll, you know, you'll couple yourself with some other uh, principles, uh, like uh, you know, to not be image-based and so on. And uh, and it's not hard, no matter how complicated this is in as a as a problem. The solutions will always be easy. Just, you know, but but when you know the nature of the devil, and you know the nature of the framework, then of course you can battle it and you can be conscious of it earlier. Inshallah. Other than that, of course, as I had mentioned, that the ones that we've always heard about, that nothing will provi provide you that protection, such as, uh, of, uh, in, uh, uh, for example, uh, Surah Kahf will be the protection, first ten, the last ten, um, to regularly read and seek refuge from the fitna of the Dajjal. And, you know, one thing you guys should, again, young people, you know Imam Ghazali is called Hujjat al-Islam because he tested it. Try this yourselves. The Friday when you don't read Kahf, don't intend to not read it, but if you don't read Kahf on the Friday, Surah Kahf, yeah? The first 10 or the last 10, if you can't read any, just read the last 10 verses of Surah Kahf. Protects you from the fitna. See how your week goes when you don't read it. And then see how your weeks go when you do read it. And you will see that because you don't have that protection, you become more susceptible to certain things that when you do read it, you don't fall into. And I, you, when, you will know God in a way that people will just not be able to know because you will have lived it. When you live it, trust me, you're going to be, a, you know, your mind and knowledge of Allah will just become profound and you'll almost feel like this whole life is just, Allah's designed it just so that you can come to know Him and be beautiful, inshallah. Like you all know, right? Inshallah. And, أَقُولُ قَوْلِ هَذَا وَأَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهُ وَأَتُبُوا إِلَيْهُ وَسِيكُمْ مَأُوسِي نَفْسِي I do advise myself first and foremost and then I just share, inshallah, some wisdom for yourself and, um, you know, be careful as you go through this life, inshallah. May Allah protect us all. Um, but remember, the, also the advice was that don't try to take on the job, right? Run. And that's why you see many of our teachers, they, they decide not to have the Instagram account or they decide not to be in those places. Because when you were there at that time, you know what's going to happen. So you want to fight it. So you're not there at that time. May Allah protect you all, inshallah. I'm sorry if I went a bit extra. If there are any questions, if anyone has any questions, you can ask. Real quickly, I'd like to mention that we, uh, City Sak will be doing a workshop this Sunday, uh, fortified the self. It's from 2.30 to 6.30. There's still time to register. And for those watching online, there's a live stream link as well. Uh, let's your option on there as well. So we'll, we'll take questions now. Uh, let me take one online. I'll say a philosophy major here. How does the current adaptation we're seeing of John Stuart Mill's harm principle factor into these the, the gel worldview influences? I don't, I don't know that. Yeah. I don't know. Figured. That. Yeah. Good okay. one, though. Let's, let's get a softball now. Makes you want to read about it. 
No, it's, it's excellent. And, you know, I, w- what I would say is, is that, like, you know, um, just it's just a couple of terms you need to get familiar with, and that's all it is. They're not that complicated principles. You just got to read about them, get to understand them, and I'll tell you, these ideologies, they have nothing on what Islam has to offer. So I have no, uh, because I might not know it, I, it's not, it's just the strength in Islam is, is a piece of cake, uh, but I, I don't know it, so it will be wrong for me to comment on that. But I, I will say is, is that um, just for those who are thinking about the Sunday class, um, it's uh, not complicated like this. In the sense, like it's not this ideological deep. That's literally prophetic statements for protection. Very straightforward, but very, again, relative to how to protect yourself in regards to this. But it's it's more the direct kind of uh, statements the Prophet Sallallahu would have. And I, and I hope that, you know, all of you, if you're able to come, do come to it. Don't worry about, like, being able to attend or, like, you know, just take a bit of time, come to the class. Uh, don't worry about, like, finances, things like that. These are irrelevant things. Just... Do it so that you know you are able to make it to the class, inshallah. This the pr- pr- protection is in the words of the Prophet, yeah, not in sophistry. Yeah, if you can't make the class, just send us an email, we'll take care of you, inshallah. Questions now, yeah. I will say, um, for that question that was emailed, if you can just email me that question, whoever that was on the online, okay. And uh, if you email me, and then we'll have a conversation on, on that, sure. Very quiet group tonight, inshallah. Thank you. Sorry. Assalamualaikum. So my question is that, um, like, I guess basically my whole life I've consumed everything that you talked about um, on the board there. So what steps can we? I know you highlighted something, but what else can we do to undo the damage? that we, that has already been done. And then like, you know, uh, in my case, like, you know, I'm responsible for our next generation as well. So can- yeah, it's a good question. I mean, look, like I said, we're all, uh, we're all recipients of this. Yeah. But I shared this little story when I was away. Uh, I don't know if I'd shared it in America or in Australia or what, but so I don't know which was that. I don't know if I shared this, but if I, anyone has to hear it again, I'll tell you a little interesting story. So, so, this became a personal journey of mine where I want to, but like one of the things that one of our teachers said was that, you know, we will never get to the, to the level of the, of our, of our tradition that was in the past, unless we, we, we drink from the, from the wells that they drank from, meaning literally going back to those places, studying with those teachers, those protected environments. So, so I went to a lot of different places in my studies. One of those places was in Yemen, in Tarim, in Hadar al and when I went there, and I spent a year there, and it's very interesting, in that whole year, I, I never saw a woman's face. Just societally, we lived in Madrasa mostly anyway, but even when we, whenever we were out, there were niqabs, and it wasn't like a, it wasn't like a Sharia police niqab, it was more like a prophetic standard niqab society, like the Ummahat of the, the believers, the mothers of the believers type of a level of living. But when I came back, I didn't realize what was happening. When I came back, I was sitting on the bus, uh, so I was uh, sitting in the car, and in front of me was a bus, and at the back of the bus was a picture of a very famous um, pop star lady. So you know when the, when a picture, like when they look at the camera, when they take a picture, then you, in the, the picture looks like it's looking at you, right? So I was sitting there using my phone, and so I see this lady's looking at me, all right? And, I, and what I did was, as I noticed she's looking, I moved so that the panel blocked her view from me, Yeah? And then, I, and then I realized what just happened. My fitra had become restored to when I was young, to when I was like shy that this lady's looking at me. Yeah. And I was like, I was about to cry. I thought it's actually possible. The meaning that any harm that was done can be undone like that. So never give the harm any more power. The, people talk about the harmful gaze. Who do, everybody talks about the Nazar and stuff like that, right? Oh, my cousin did some juju on me or whatever, yeah? There's the healing gaze. The healing, where there's the negative eye, there's the positive eye. You see the positive eye and you feel like 
you know, amazing. That's the same eyes the Prophet ﷺ looked at people and they became Sahaba. They looked at somebody, they became Tabi'in. They looked at somebody, they became Tabi'in. That's how powerful it was that just by the gaze, these became the three greatest generation. This became the greatest generation, these three generations. So, you know, like, and the way to protect it is just following as much of a Sunnah lifestyle as possible because a Sunnah lifestyle is, a, is the best Fitra lifestyle. أصبحنا على فطرة الإسلام وعلى كلمة الإخلاص وعلى دين نبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى ملة أبينا إبراهيم حنيفا مسلما وما كان من المشركين. It's all there. We woke up on the on the fitra of Islam, right? And the religion of our Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. So just follow the Sunnah, and your restoration will all take place. And the more you do it, you would. It, our tradition doesn't say like do it outwardly and fix that person. You fix yourself. They will see the impact. So, you know, so don't give that too much power. We're all recipients of it. Yeah, alhamdulillah, here we are on a Friday night to no merit of our own, but Allah's mercy on us. You know, in this madness world that it's out there, these guys can do a million things on a Friday night. But alhamdulillah, we're here. So Allah's protected you here. So take the protection that Allah has done and the restoration and believe in the promise of Allah. You follow the sunnah. And, and you will become like the Sunnah. You, following the Sunnah is mirroring the Prophet Sallallahu Molana Rumi, you know, I, I share this, this cute little... Molana Rumi says, what do you buy? What do you gift Yusuf? What could you uh, possibly gift Yusuf? They say, what you gift Yusuf is a mirror. Because there's nothing you can give Yusuf because he's got everything. He's the he's minister of Egypt and, you know, you gift him a mirror. So what do you give the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? You gift him a mirror, meaning the most prophetic version of you. And you will have the power and the light of the Prophet ﷺ shine through you and the protection and all of that will be there. So, you know, 100% the fitrah will be restored. Just get back to, all of us, get back to as much natural living as possible, you know. And then the du'as that I cover on Sunday, like they are, you know, I'll, tell, I'll give you one of them. Just one quick one. Remember in the Lion King, you remember the Timon and Pumbaa, you know, what did they say to Simba? What was the famous line they said to him? Akuna Matata, right? What does it mean? It means no worries for the rest of your days. Yeah? We have a far better version in our tradition. It, it tops it. We just we read it every morning in the Vril what, what, what is it? Masha Allah, Kana wa Malam ya Sha'lam ya Kum. Masha Allah, what Allah willed, Kana happened. Wa Malam ya Sha'lam. And what he did not will did not happen. It closes the chapter on any drama you got currently. I didn't get the job that I worked so hard for. Masha Allah kana wa ma'alam ya sha'lam ya kun wa la hawla wa la quwata illa billah. Move on. I didn't get married to so and so even though for three years I thought she was going to marry me. Masha Allah. What Allah will kana. I don't. I take power away from her. That's why we say la hawla wa la quwata illa billah. She is not the power move. These none of you guys have the power. You don't have the power except when you're with God. Then Allah will move amazing mountains. Mountains will be moved through you. Masha Allah, kana wa ma lam yasha lam yakun. Wala hawla wala quwata illa billah. And you just imagine how you can function from that. And that is our hukuna matata. Amazing, isn't it? <laughs> but it's so much more powerful and strong and direction filled, qibla filled. So we're sitting on, we got the power. There's many more. Okay. Any questions? 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 Just raise your hand. There we go. Assalamualaikum. Waalaikumsalam. Um, I'm so sorry. I I wasn't here in the beginning, um, so I, I hope I didn't miss. So going back on narcissism and me, me, me. So the idea is, is that how we should stick to basics. So my idea is like if we stick to basics and raise the next generation, inshallah, like that. The problem is, is that the idea of living in the West, you know, they're going to get exposed somehow, no matter how much we try. And we've seen that with our own eyes. And going back, like the sister said, that's our struggle of, you know, this toxic feminism and masculinity that is far away from the ummah. 
So my question is, is that how do you do it to a point where um, they're not a stranger to the outside world, but at the same time you stay inside that circle? You know, uh, well, Allah, 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 you know, there's lots of different answers to this, but one of the things that I would say is that when you make them comfortable, when you, when you make them comfortable in knowing that you will be a stranger to some degree, there's a comfort in that. Look at the Jewish community. Look how they've established and mobilized. They stay so strong on their principles. Excuse me. They stay so, so, stay so strong on their principles, yet they are part of society because they have a really healthy sense of understanding of the self. Look, I'm, I'm going to trust. It's all in identity. It is all in the identity of the child. You know how we survived so many things when we were young was because we were just, we didn't identify with that. We were different. We just identify that we don't roll like that. We don't. We just don't do that. Whether it was Pakistani, whether it was Muslim, whether it was Muslim, British, Pakistani, whatever formulations we had, whatever terms they are, you have to remember that if you want to be from the pure ones as a, to the young lads, I would literally be like, you have to understand that you will be an alien to some degree. And our tradition says, and glad tidings to the strangers. Because, you know, I had this one kid came to me, you know, we were at this one burger shop and he came and he was like, I'm interested in Islam, I got a few questions. So he came and this, you know, I said to him, so, you know, he asked a few questions on Islam and then I said, well, I asked him a few questions, I said, what, what got you interested? And he said, look, I, I just saw people like, and he mentioned like maybe five sins. And he said, I, I just, I didn't want to identify with that. Like, that's the reason. And then he became Muslim there and then. He literally just there and then in the chicken shop, you know, he just became Muslim. That it's all in the identity of the children. And I've seen people who, who I've seen kids who get homeschooled in the teenage years. Yes, they become a little bit weird, and then they, then socially they they will, they will find their place in in society. School is just a testing ground for for the world. So if they can find their if they can find their feet. Within, uh, what, within whichever communal in, in experience you give them, they will find their feet in that place. But I would say trust that. And I've seen, you know, when I was studying Arabic, I was, uh, there were many students who, ha who were uh, homeschooled and were doing PhDs. And, and I saw how they had come to a degree full circle. But, you know, but, but they will, but the whole aim is that they are not a part of society because if we make them so comfortable that they're part of society, this is the problem of, I guess, the da'i as well, like, because you try to do that that one, but then you get the traces of where you go out to, like, everybody has this, like, you have those friends you don't want to sometimes chill with, but then you have to chill with them, and then you leave picking up a word, or you might have backbite, and you're like, darn it, you know, what happened? So part of it is that protection, and you're not going to just get that protection for free. So... I would say make comfort in knowing that you're different. And you know, this beautiful hadith, the Prophet, Allah, the, the Prophet says that Allah is amazed at the young person who restrains his passion or he doesn't show his passions instantly. Like you will become a superstar. Like if these boys here, or even the women here, like if you turn down a chance of being alone and, and engaging in, in the most you know bad behavior with the opposite gender, but you can say no to that, you get the reward of a mujahid. You get the reward of a mujahid. What's the reward of a mujahid? If you can say no to a woman who offers herself to you, before your blood reaches the ground, when you pass away, your place in Jannah is secured. That makes these young, inshallah, should make them be like, that's why I want to roll. I want to be to that level. So you got to create comfort in not conforming to society. And the young, the young people love that because they all want to be special. So show them what real special, special is. Oh, I used to walk around, we used to be walking college with our jubas on. We used to, you know, we were like 16, 17, 18. I used to get buses in the most non-Muslim white areas because we were like, we were mujahids, like that was like our front row, you know. And it, we were so comfortable in that. I remember going to my workplace and I said to my, uh, uh, you know, and, and I got this from my elder sisters because they were working in, in like the most normal shops and they would pray at work. And I remember going and saying, hey, Rachel, I got to go pray. She said, why, what you do? I said, I don't do anything. I do. We just we just pray. But that was character building on another level. So that reinforcement by seeing my siblings, my older sister doing it, my other sister doing it, my other brother doing it, I was like, yeah, that's, we're those, we're those special people. And it, and it, it helps you in your journey. You know, as young people, they, 
you know, and the young, the, these are the movers and shakers. If they don't do it, you know, we, we'll be in trouble. We're too busy, the rest of us now, we're a bit older. But, but you know, trust it, inshallah, it's, you got it. Yeah. Uh, speaking of our youth, Brother Yusuf has a question on our unicorns, inshallah. Uh, so, you were talking about how, like, when anything happens, you're just supposed to say, mashallah, can you? Uh, so, what if, like, those, whatever happened to you, can you change that by making dua? Like, is it, is it more beneficial to like, ask Allah to return whatever he uh, took from you? I mean, you, you can't ask that. You can't ask that. Um, one of the beautiful things that Allah gives you, Allah gives you choice even in your du'as. You know, I, I, I made dua today for something, a Jummah, and then I laughed because because I felt it was like, Allah told me in that moment, like, you know I don't do that. <laughs> but I just asked, yeah? So I can still ask. But at the same time, what happens as you go through life is you start to learn the sunnah of Allah, how Allah does things. And you start to realize that, well, Allah does things in a very particular way. And the more you come to know God, the more you'll know how He does what He does. When that happens, you you know, so you may still ask those questions, but you will start to have a more of a faith in God, knowing that in that moment, I didn't like it, but maybe long term, I'm going to see why that wasn't good for me. And so then Allah will show you. So, no, you know, we do have moments to ask that. The real superstar, look, think what the Prophet ﷺ did. Remember, Ta'if, they threw the stones on him. He comes out and he says to God, if this is what you want for me, then let me, and essentially what he's saying is, let me be to the level of what you want from me. So the believer doesn't say, oh Allah, this is hard. You know, or oh, if, if, if you're going to, if you chose this for me, let me be strong that I can take this on. The Moroccans, they used to make this dua, yeah? what they would say is, when difficult times happen, they say, oh Allah, make the night more intense so that the dawn may come. So, so what they would say is, basically what their mind was, Allah believes in me in this moment. That's why He gave it to me. So how can I doubt myself? You get it? So you believe in yourself by believing in Allah because He put me in that situation. So I, I got it within me. So Allah, okay, I wanted the red toffee, but you gave me the green one. All right. You know, oh Allah, if you can give me the red one, red one, but if it's the green one for me, then the green one it is. And, and, and in fact, you might turn around and say, oh Allah, actually now I love the green one because you chose it for me. You see, this level... This is what the believers are like. Because there's one, the Prophet said, the Amur al-Mu'min is khayr. So the believer knows that anything Allah does for you is the best. It's just the best. There's a one Imam Ghazali says, if you had all knowledge and, and all power, if you had absolute knowledge and absolute power, you know, have you seen Aladdin? Aladdin, the cartoon. Hmm? Oh, okay, good. Well, in the, there's the genie, he gets these superpowers at the end there. Eh? In, in, in Imam Ghazali says, if you have all knowledge and all power, you will choose for your life what Allah has already decreed for you. Meaning you start to realize that this where I am is perfect. And so yeah, then you start to celebrate whatever Allah has chosen for you. So you, you can do both. You can say, oh Allah, I still wanted to marry her, but you know, if it's not meant to be, I'll move on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Done. Inshallah. Thank you. Any other questions? <coughs> Maybe we can wrap up with the city. Inshallah. Uh, we have one online. Uh, if you could give us one piece of advice to address of all the challenges of the Jal system, what would that one piece of advice be? Uh, I think I did. I spoke for. I spoke about that, but I would just say read Surah Kahf. You know, just keep it regular for yourself. Um, and remember, Surah Kahf is not just what you read like a spiritual thing. There's a lot of stories in Surah Kahf that tell you great lessons. And a lot of those lessons are actually what build a resilience to this. That, that's one of the beautiful things of Surah Kaf is there's stories there that build a, a framework that counters this, that it doesn't make you like Musa alayhi salam is like, why did, you, why did you do this? Yeah, but constantly he's getting like, uh, uh don't ask again. Oh, but why did you do this? Uh, what? And then he reminds you that, in the moment, you'll say to God, oh, but why did you do this? And Allah is telling you, no, no, no. You just wait and see. So when you read Surah Kaf regularly, you're always reminded. Weekly reminder. 
is wait and see. So one of the beauties of Surah Kaf is they are weekly stories that you, you, you actually need to hear. So I would say really just read it in English and re revisit those stories and revisit the morals of those stories, the lessons. There's so many of them. Inshallah, may Allah give us all strength and really spiritual uh, conditioning. and I mean, that's why life's happening is spiritual conditioning. When you can handle a yes to that, Allah will throw you another moment. You, you stay strong. Before you know it, you'll become a sign of God. And people will be like, how do you do it, man? That I, I'm telling you this, I swear people will say, how do you do this? Who are you? Why? And you'll just be like, it's not me, it's God. And that's who it's always ever been. Inshallah, <laughs> he's the only, he's the haq, he's the real. Yeah. Anyway, may Allah protect you all. Allah bless you. And, you know, thank you for coming as well. It makes me happy when I see people coming. So you made my heart happy as well. People are seeking knowledge and learning. And you guys all now, inshallah, leave with lights. And uh, take those lights, share them with your communities. And uh, Allah bless you all. Have a good night, inshallah.